Hi, I'm Jared Walton with Tom's Hardware, and I am here today with perhaps the abomination of graphics card launches for 2022, the GTX 1630. Launched officially last month, we had to wait a little bit to get ours, and the reason is pretty simple. No one should be buying this graphics card. Right now it's selling for about $200, that's what it's listed for on EVGA site. Colorful was kind enough to send us their card and no offense to Colorful, but it's overpriced. Because EVGA has a GTX 1650 that uses the same GPU, the Turing TU-117, but with more cores enabled, more memory bandwidth, and it's at a lower price of $169. So go figure. Or if you prefer something that's not NVIDIA, Radeon RX 6400 doesn't have as many video outputs, it's missing the DVI port, basically. And it's a modern graphics card, uses less power, and is available for as little as $139. Also doesn't require a power connector, and it's available in low profile formats. So, what do you get from the lovely GTX 1630? You get warmed over Turing. A lobotomized Turing. In fact, this is half of a TU-117 chip. Half of the memory channels are disabled, half of the GPU cores are disabled. Uh, that's probably for harvesting purposes. You know, they didn't get fully functional chips. After three years of manufacturing this chip, they probably have a bunch that couldn't be sold as an MX450, couldn't be sold as a GTX 1650. But, hey, what if we do something else? And so we get the GTX 1630. This card probably should have launched last year at latest, in the middle of the drought of GPUs when cryptocurrency mining was buying up everything and GTX 1650 cards were going for $300 or more. At $200, it could have made some sort of sense back then. But today, it's too little and far too late. Let's hit to the specs quickly. You get 512 CUDA cores, 10 streaming multiprocessors, a 64-bit memory interface, and it's populated with 12 gigabits per second GDDR6 memory. So again, if you look at the GTX 1650 Super, a card which is also available at EVGA for $200, you are getting half of that for the same price. It makes no sense. Now you might say, well, maybe it's lower power. And technically it does use less power in our testing, but you still need a six pin power connector. And at that point it's like, if you need a six pin power connector, are you really gonna be worried about 50 to 75 watts of power draw versus 75 to 85 watts of power draw? I don't think so. We'll go ahead and move straight to the benchmarks because that's what you're here for. We've got a limited selection of cards here, all of these budget cards dating back to the GTX 1050 and 1050 Ti that launched clear back in 2016. You can see that the GTX 1630 does manage to beat the 1050 by a little bit, but it loses to the 1050 Ti, and that card was supposed to have launched at $140, the GTX 1050 was $110, so why are we paying $200 for this today? Or there's the GT1030, which nominally launched for a price of $79 for the DDR3 version, which is actually substantially worse than the GDDR5 version that we tested, which launched later and had a starting price of just $70. Now again, cryptocurrency prices last year caused a graphics card drought combined with the pandemic stuff, and GPU prices shot up. If this card had launched then, people might have paid for it at $200, but today it should be a $100 card, full stop. I mean, let's look at the benchmarks. It falls behind everything except the 1050 and the 1030 and the RX 560. That's a card from 2016. Like this is nothing anyone should be excited about. Flipping through the individual game charts, we've got Borderlands 3, same basic story, except the RX 560 outperforms the 1630. Uh, moving on, we got Far Cry 6. Again, performance is barely scraping by at 1080p medium. Then we've got Flight Simulator. It's playable, barely. Forza Horizon 5. Again, playable, barely. We're getting past 30 frames per second, and that's about it. 
go to more demanding games. Well, hold off a second for that. Horizon Zero Dawn, Two, another again. game that's playable, but it's not super smooth. And then we move on to Red Dead Redemption on 2. Again, game. playable. This one actually gets closer to 60, but it's not getting 60 frames per second. And then Total War Warhammer 3. This tends to be one of the more demanding games in our benchmark suite for whatever reason. Uh, you could probably get by with lower frame rates because it's a strategy game. But still, this is one of those games that fell below 30 frames per second, even at 1080p medium. And then finally, we've got Watch Dogs Legion, which again, you could play, but it's not the most awesome experience. So at 1080p medium, it's sufficient. But again, look at the overall view. There are a bunch of GPUs that are faster, that cost the same or less. And if you're willing to go back and get a used card from any time in the past like eight years, I mean, look at this. Here's a GTX 970. This is our full view of everything we've tested. And you can see the GTX 970 blows it away. You can buy those for under $100 off eBay. I'm not sure I'd want an eight-year-old 970, but I don't want a 1630 either. If we bump up the quality levels to 1080p Ultra, things just go from bad to worse. Nothing got above 30 frames per second. I'm not going to belabor the point here. Let's just flip through the charts. Borderlands 3, blah. Uh, Far Cry 6, same story. Terrible frame rates. Flight simulators, unplayable. Uh, Forza Horizon 5, totally unplayable because at our extreme setting, it uses way more than 4 gigabytes of VRAM. Moving on, Horizon Zero Dawn, also not great. Red Dead Redemption 2, uh, it, it doesn't even want to run at the ultra settings we used, but we're able to tweak the config file and get it to load. Sometimes you get some graphical glitches, but basically it's not a great experience. And then finally we have Total War Warhammer 3, which is down in the like 10 frames per second range, and uh, Watch Dogs Legion. If we open this up to the full spectrum of GPUs we've tested at 1080p Ultra, you can see how far down the chart the GTX 1630 sits. It's really just like unconscionable that this card would be released at $200. And maybe, maybe the price will come down. It should. How much would this card have to cost in order to be viable? I mean, it's a 1630. Nominally, that replaces the GT 1030, but... It's a GTX now instead of a GT because it has NVIDIA's NV Inc. hardware video encoding support. Now, this isn't the later Turing NV Inc. This is the Pascal variant or Volta variant, which are basically the same. It doesn't have quite as high of support, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, it does enough. Are people really that interested in GPU-assisted video encoding on a card like a GTX 1630? There might be a few that want that, but, but it's got to be a pretty small number. So overall, it's a disappointing card. It's not just disappointing, it's kind of a pointless card. We understand you might have GPUs that you want to sell, but you can't sell them at a higher price than cards that perform faster and use the same basic hardware. So pricing needs to come way down on this before anyone should buy it. Even if pricing does drop, I would still say the RX 6400, RX 6500 XT, those would be more promising graphics cards. They're faster and they cost less right now. I mean, the ray tracing support is meaningless, but so is hardware video encoding support on a card that's this slow. I mean, I guess you could be streaming Fortnite or CSGO. So that about does it for this card. We're looking forward to Ada Lovelace and the RDNA 3 cards, which are going to be much more expensive, obviously, but they'll also hopefully offer something new at competitive pricing. We'll see. We'll find out probably in the next month or two. But until then, stay tuned and don't buy a GTX 1630.